I feel like I'm acting out the, the caricature of somebody who is in the military by arriving with a PowerPoint <laughs> briefing. And normally, in fact, uh, as you will see from my graphics, uh, my PowerPoint skills are quite limited. And uh, under normal circumstances, I would just make a presentation uh, with a text or just some notes. But given the fact that uh, I have lots of cool pictures to show you <laughs> and some maps and other things that I thought it was important that we kind of do the uh, PowerPoint briefing. I, first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Evan Feigenbaum and, and certainly Secretary Paulson for uh, inviting me to make, uh, make this presentation and come to Chicago. It's been many years since I've been here. Uh, I, I have a broad topic to cover, so I'm going to sort of race through these. I'm going to try to touch on three central themes. Uh, first, China's recently announced uh, ambition to become a maritime power. In other words, China as a maritime power. And secondly, take a closer look at one aspect of that maritime power, which is the PLA Navy, the People's Liberation Army Navy, uh, China's Navy. Uh, and thirdly, if we have enough time to talk about the South China Sea and the East China Sea, which uh, has uh, been, the, both of those areas have been the sites of competition and p potential confrontation between Japan and China in the East China Sea and, of course, the Philippines and Vietnam uh, uh, in the South China Sea. So in uh, former uh, party uh, general secretary Hu Jintao's uh, swan song report to the 18th Party Congress uh, toward the end of 2012. Uh, he uh, made, uh, addressed and, and had in his text two really interesting comments. One was that China should create a powerful armed forces, quote, commensurate with China's international standing with no further definition of what that actually meant or means. And then he also talked specifically about the fact that China should become a maritime power. The quote that I have uh, there in the second quote from the uh, People's Liberation Army white paper that came out in April 2013 uh, reiterated uh, what uh, uh, who said at the time. Uh, but I thought I would uh, put the PLA commentary in there because uh, this white paper came out after Xi Jinping was, in fact, the, the general secretary and the president of China. So essentially, this is his, his white paper. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, this raises two questions. Um, why does China want to become a maritime power? What are the, what are the motivations there? And when China's leaders speak about becoming a maritime power, what do they mean? Not what U.S., what an American uh, strategist or n n navalist would say, but what do the Chinese mean when they talk about maritime power? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the, I think the why is pretty straightforward uh, to why become one is uh, if you look at the following factors, First century of humiliation, 1842, beginning of the Opium War, first Opium War, 1945. All of, all of the people who invaded and, and humiliated China came by sea. The Japanese also came by land via Manchuria, but they also came by sea. So you had the British, you had the French, you had the Boxer Rebellion uh, and intervention, which included U.S. forces, uh, uh, Chinese for, or, uh, Japanese forces, and what have you. So, the century of humi humiliation was essentially based on people coming from the sea and, and invading China. Uh, the second one, the second motivation would be virtually all of China's outstanding sovereignty issues. Now you, you probably know this, but China has reconciled its border disputes with, with the Russians, with the Vietnamese, uh, not so much with the Indians, but everywhere else around their periphery. Over the, during the 1990s, they reconciled all the outstanding border, border disputes. But all of their disputes in the maritime domain, Taiwan, Taiwan's a maritime issue, it's an island. 
all of the, uh, the sovereignty disputes in East China Sea and South China Sea. So they're all maritime in nature. So you have outstanding sovereignty issues that are maritime in nation. That's the, third re the second reason. Uh, third, uh, the fact that China's uh, global economic interests uh, have created global political interests. And having a maritime uh, uh, in, uh, capabilities that allow you to, uh, if, if necessary, support those political interests and what have you, uh, is, is very important to them. And fourth, of course, trade. Trade is essentially the, the economic takeoff, China's economic takeoff, has been founded on essentially global trade. And most of that trade travels by sea. Uh, uh, fifth, this is sort of anecdotal, but uh, people who have lived in China r frequently remind me, not too long ago there was a, a series, a very popular series on, on one uh, CCC TV, I'm not sure which channel, uh, talking about great powers. And it looked, at, it looked at the Romans, and it looked at the, uh, the, the Venetians, and the Spaniards, and the Dutch, and the England, in English, and the United States, and what was the common denominator? They all were maritime powers. Uh, and so uh, there, there, at least in the people I deal with uh, and interact with, there seems to be a sense that uh, if you want to be a great power, you need to be a maritime power. Uh, and finally, it's because they can. China has, for the first time in, since, arguably since 1405, uh, when uh, Admiral Zheng Ha has sailed around the Indian Ocean literal, China has the money and the interest and the wherewithal to be able to become a maritime power. So that's, that's my answer to the why. Now let me talk about what do the Chinese mean about maritime power. So I have up here, uh, based upon research, I'm, I'm working on a project on China as a maritime power, and, and uh, we have uh, at, at the Center for Naval Analyses, uh, we have a division of uh, about 22 people who all read and speak Mandarin, who all do research in, in open source Chinese language source articles, go conduct interviews in China and what have you. And, and when the Chinese talk about being a maritime power, this is what they say. And this is, of course, what if you were to scratch a U.S. Coast Guard officer or what have you and say, what do you think being a maritime power means, you get the same answer. It's the Navy, it's the Coast Guard, it's the shipbuilding industry, it's the merchant marine, it's the fishing industry, uh, you know, exploiting uh, deep sea mining and, and uh, oil exploration, and your seaport infrastructure. So the reason those four categories are in red is because China is already at the top of the heap in those categories. They, they, they don't have to aspire to be a maritime power in those particular areas. They already are. So it's no, long, it's, no, it's no longer an aspirational thing. It's a reality as far as that's concerned. So let me quickly give you some, I'll bore you with some data here, but they're, they're either, depending upon how you count, either in tonnage or the number of hulls delivered, they're the first or second largest shipbuilder in the world. Now there's been a downturn in shipbuilding since 2008 when the global economic crisis, and so there is a bit of a glut of shipbuilding around the world right now, but the people who are getting orders for new ships are essentially Chinese uh, shipbuilders and South Koreans, and the Chinese are moving into areas where South Korea and Japan has had strength, which is in higher technology, more complicated double hull ships as opposed to either break buck carriers or, or large container ships. Uh, their merchant marine, between the combination of state-owned enterprises and private entrepreneurs, uh, China owns about 3,600 merchant ships. So you say, so what is that? Uh, that's, that's second, uh, that's third, excuse me. The Germans have 3,800, the Japanese have slightly more than 100. So China is number three in, within 200 ships of being the largest ship owner, merchant ship owner in the world today. Um, if you look at just uh, Chinese flagships, in other words, so many of these ships that they own are, are uh, flagged with flags of convenience, Panama, Liberia, and what we can talk about that if you want to know more about a flag of convenience. But uh, in terms of the actual ships that fly the Chinese flag, they are also third. Uh, 
uh, about 2,900 of those. The fishing industry, the numbers are absolutely staggering. There are over 600, 675,000 registered motorized fishing vessels in China. Uh, and China, this, I got this data from the Wall Street Journal, uh, I think it was in 2012, it could have been 2013. China consumes about 51% of the global fish catch in the world. Uh, whereas number two is India, and they consume 10%. And so uh, distant water fishing, it's a category of fishing boat where they will sail, for example, from China to the coast of Africa or the coast of, of uh, South America, what have you. Uh, they have uh, about, uh, let me see, 2,300 fishing boats that are special purpose to go these long distances and conduct fishing. Just by way of comparison, the United States has 200. So uh, when it comes to, um, to these categories I've talked about, as I say, not only are the numbers staggering, but there's no question about it uh, that, in fact, China is already a maritime power. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is it has to do with the last port, which is seaport infrastructure. Just take a look at that. That's the 10 largest uh, total ports by cargo. I, the best data I could find was 2012. Seven of the 10 are Chinese. Uh, and uh, the little annotations like East China Sea, South, uh, Yellow Sea, I, I just to indicate where those ports actually are. Uh, and if you were just to look at the container ports, uh, that, and this is both containers as well as, as, well as um, um, break bulk cargo and what have you. If you were going to just look at the container ports, they also have seven of the ten largest. And in the container point ports, one of the interest, another one of those little interesting things, uh, the largest U.S. container port, the Port of Los Angeles, is number 19 on the list. And if you were to combine Los Angeles and Long Beach, the two largest U.S. container ports, uh, that roughly equi uh, equates to 25 percent of what the number of containers at Shanghai alone ships. So the numbers, as I say, the, the numbers, if, you, if there was any doubt about China's trade, you just have to look at these ports and what's going on in the world. And they've built the infrastructure. I mean, these are, these are functioning ports that are in, uh, incredibly advanced and technologically sophisticated. So, so that's, now I'm going to shift on you now. I've, that's a kind of my overview of why ch China is a maritime power, what, what, uh, what, what they're in, why they're doing it, and where they stand in terms of the various categories of maritime power. Now I want to do a little bit of a deep dive in the category of maritime power that I'm most familiar with, which is the Chinese Navy or the PLA Navy. This uh, view graph uh, uh, is intended to talk, uh, to demonstrate essentially Chinese naval strategy for defending China. Remember I said one of the motivations for becoming a maritime power is because you don't want to be invaded from the sea? Well, this is essentially uh, their approach to it. Uh, they, uh, it's called the first island chain and the second island chain. The first island chain, as you can see, Japan down through Taiwan along the Philippines uh, and around, essentially encompassing East China Sea and South China Sea. So essentially what China's uh, strategic aim is to have, be able to dem to have sea control, the important word there is control, control of the South China Sea and East China Sea. In other words, they can deny it to anybody any time they want to. That any hostile force, if, it, if it's coming to, that China has the ability to make sure they will not be successful. And now the area between the first island chain and the second island chain, which runs through Guam and then down through the uh, South, uh, Central Pacific, South Pacific, generally is, is the Philippine Sea. That is an area which is con contested. In other words, they don't, China doesn't claim that they will have the ability to control it. But if, for example, if there was a, a U.S. reinforcement a Navy coming across, it's easier for me to get up and point. <laughs> um, does this have a laser on it? No, okay. Uh, if the U.S. 
was coming across to reinforce, say, an inv uh, invasion of Taiwan. Let's say China decided they were going to invade Taiwan. And the U.S. decided we're going to ride to the rescue. What they want to do is keep the U.S. reinforcements as far away as possible. So what they would do here is have submarines in this area, airplanes launched launch from ashore with anti-ship cruise missiles, and then finally ballistic missiles that have the ability to maneuver uh, and, uh, and hit a, uh, a moving ship, which is not a trivial problem. Um, to be able to deny that. So that, you may hear people talk about anti-access area denial or A2 AD, A squared AD. That's what they're talking about, anti-access area denial. It's the ability to try to deny the second area. If U.S. reinforcements, for example, if, now obviously the U.S. 7th Fleet is here, the Japanese Navy's there and what, they're already there. But to, to, uh, try to turn back an invasion of Taiwan or what have you. I'm not saying that's likely. I think it's very unlikely. But uh, that's what the, this plan is all about. So when you hear people talking about anti-access area denial, it's really talking about having some sort of a fight out here in the Philippine Sea. Submarines, air launch cruise missiles, ballistic missiles. Well, the ballistic missiles don't belong to the Navy. They belong to the 2nd Artillery Corps. And most of the airplanes belong to the, the PLA Air Force, not the PLA Navy. So the Navy piece of this is only their submarine force, really. They're not going to, they're not going to, China's not going to send its surface ships out here where they would be vulnerable to U.S. submarines. So when you talk about naval developments, though, uh, the more interesting thing in terms of being a maritime power is what's going on in the part of the Navy that is used in peacetime, which happily is most of the time. How do you, because submarines are not really good to be out and about because nobody can see them until you surface in somebody's port. But the, the Navy, remember, global interest, global economic interest have generated global uh, political interest and whatever. So what kind of a Navy do you want to be out and about? Well, you want a pretty damn good one, and that's what China is building. Uh, this, is, this, this ship was commissioned uh, in uh, March of last year. It's the first of a, uh, uh, a promised class of, of, of approximately uh, 14 or 15, uh, and it's essentially their equivalent, the Chinese equivalent to a, uh, the, the, the newest and best U.S. destroyer. Uh, with uh, uh, but an Aegis radar system, phased array uh, uh, antennas. Again, let me use my finger. These flat panels right here are radar uh, uh, antennas. Vertical launch system, there's little holes in the, or square boxes in the deck that have vertical launch missiles. Here's a helicopter, and you would have uh, 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 anti-ship cruise missiles here. So this ship, it's about uh, 8,000 tons. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art, uh, and as I say, it's equivalent to uh, uh, to the the frontline U.S. destroyers in terms of cap in terms of capability. So, uh, if you look out to 2020, as I said, the PLA Navy will have the second best Navy in the world. It'd be the most balanced. It'll be balanced across the spectrum of capabilities. Uh, and it will start with uh, about 20 of these ships. As I said, there's six earlier versions of this and then the 14 or so they'll build between now and then. It will include this frigate, uh, which again is uh, the newest, uh, the oldest one of these was commissioned in 2006. So these are relatively New frigate. These are the most most of the ships that the China has sent to the Northern Arabian Sea to do anti-piracy patrols are, are this class of ship. They're very effective. They've proven to be very reliable. Um, uh, estimate about 40 of these by 2020. 
Uh, here's uh, a Chinese replenishment ship with two Chinese uh, destroyers alongside and one astern uh, conducting replenishment operations in the Northern Arabian Sea. China has been, China's been doing this for six years. Starting in December of 2008, they've had constantly have at least three ships on duty in the Northern Arabian Sea, Gulf of Aden area on counter piracy patrols. They've been out there for eight or nine months, as long as any U.S. Navy deployment. And they've learned how to deploy and sustain ships halfway around the world from China. They've been operating with the world's best navies for the last eight years and have learned lessons and have become quite capable and quite adept uh, at operating, uh, as I say, halfway around the world from China. Uh, this is a class of amphibious ships that carries between 800, or excuse me, 600 and 800 uh, 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 soldiers or Marines. And by 2020, they'll have about uh, uh, six of these and perhaps two larger ones, uh, which would give them an amphibious projection force of about 8,000. You could put 8,000 troops uh, somewhere along the Asian littoral. Um, and of course, this is the one everybody wants to talk about, the aircraft carrier. As it says, this, is, this was a, a former uh, Soviet Ukrainian um, uh, bought, remember it was originally towed, towed to China and sold as a floating casino. It, the casino has morphed into a real ship. Uh, uh, and so, um, God, the amount of money they had to pour into that to put in a new engineering plant and what have you is just mind-boggling. But uh, they're actually uh, it now. Uh, it's about sixty-five thousand tons. Uh, the U.S. standard carrier, for example, the George Washington, was about uh, ninety-eight thousand tons. So this is about three quarters the size. Uh, we estimate that there'll be. I estimate that there'll be about two. Uh, they're building another one similar, just like this, interest. Uh, maybe it'd be, be a little bit bigger. But when you look around at aircraft carriers around the world, if you take the U.S. out of the equation, the British are building two Queen Elizabeths uh, class. They hope to eventually get them done. Uh, uh, the Indians have uh, one secondhand uh, Russian one that they've spent, they've, it, it's a black hole throwing money down to try to get it working, and they're building another one of those. Um, uh, and the French have one smaller nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carrier. In fact, the, it happens to be in the uh, uh, Persian Gulf right now, flying sorties along with the U.S. Uh, against ISIL. Um, but the, so China will have uh, the second most powerful carrier force in the world in 2020 which has two ships. Here's, a, here's another picture that everybody likes to see. Now, that you may have noticed on the bow, of, see the, how it curves up there? They call that a ski jump. This ship does not have a catapult. So those of you who saw Top Gun, the movie, you know, and the, the music's playing and the guys there, and the shooters out there launching the airplanes, and the steam from the catapult goes and the, and the plane goes. They don't do it that way. They don't have a catapult. So what they do is their guys, you know, the shooter, but the airplane just, they take the brakes off and hope that everything turns out okay because you go, you, <laughs> because you run up and launch off, the, off a ski jump that gets you altitude and then you have to depend upon the thrust of the airplane. Uh, but the penalty associated with uh, launching that way is you can't carry a lot of stuff. The airplane can't be too heavy, so you can't load it down. If you have a full tank of gas plus air-to-air -air missiles, then you can't load a whole bunch of other surface air, uh, air-to-surface anti-ship missiles, et cetera, on it. So uh, as, it, as these uh, J, uh, J-15s, which were, are copied from the Soviet Sukhoi's 33s, uh, they are probably good for air defense. They're probably not so good for going and bombing somebody. Now, they do have a catapult, and here you, I mean, a, excuse me, a resting gear, and here you see it coming in to trap aboard the, the carrier. Uh, and China is doing, is spending a lot of time and effort slowly, and as this is ex what they have done for uh, an almost all their military modernization. It's not hurried, it's very thoughtful, 
Well, a lot of uh, essentially head work ahead of time, figuring out what they want, and then slowly but surely testing and building, testing and building and what have you. And right now, the carrier is in the slowly but surely learning how to operate an, a, a, a complete air wing. Uh, when, when that ship is fully operational with an air wing, it will be, be about 36 airplanes. 24 will be jets like this, and then the rest will be a mix of helicopters that have different missions. And finally, we should talk about submarines. <laughs> That's what makes submarines so difficult. <laughs> they create a lot of uncertainty. Where are they? Uh, and um, the issue with submarines is that um, China has a, ver a lot of conventionally powered submarines, about 40 of them. Remember I showed you out there where they would be the submarines out in the area? Well, China has, has a good number of, of, of what I would call modern, conventionally, by conventionally powered, I mean they're diesel propelled uh, and they do, they're not nuclear powered, nuclear uh, powered submarines. But China is also building, they have uh, four uh, nuclear attack submarines now and they and by 2020 they should have about six which by the way how many do the British have six how many do the French have six China right now has three new SSBNs those are ballistic missile submarines the ones that carry uh, uh, ballistic missiles nuclear tip ballistic missiles to it to blow up cities um, uh, they have three of those now the French and the British each have four and we're estimating, I estimate about uh, uh, four or so SSBNs by 2020. So, so when you talk about a Navy that I've just, the piece of the Navy I've just shown you, the Chinese have a term for it, they call it the Far Seas Navy. In the U.S., all people talk about a Blue Water Navy. Well, that's what we're talking about, a Blue Water Navy or a Far Seas Navy. The ships that I've just shown you have, are, are capable of going anywhere in the world. They're not limited to just operating in the Western Pacific or in the Indian Ocean. Uh, many of those uh, Chinese frigates and what have you that have uh, gone out on anti-piracy patrol have gone up the Red Sea through the Suez Canal, gone into the Eastern Mediterranean, gone to the Black Sea. Uh, uh, made port visits all along the entire coast of Africa, both east and west coast. And so the, this is a navy that's out and about. Uh, and as I said, in five years it will be the second, it will be the second most capable navy in the world. Now what we don't know, we don't know, we know that they, they have impressive hardware, as you saw, those ships are very modern looking, and that's because they are. Uh, but we don't know how well all that equipment will work. Will those radars work? Will those missiles work? Will, uh, how well will the engineering plant work? Will the air conditioning units break down and you have to turn off all your electronics because it overheats? All of those sorts of things, uh, we don't know for sure yet how they're gonna work, nor will we know for sure how adept their sailors will be. Uh, but, as I said, they're learning, they've been out distant a long way away from China for the past six years building a cadre of both sailors and officers especially officers who have made repeated deployments out there who are learning how to operate a task group away of, or, uh, um, away from China so that's my little now I'm going to go to the third part of the presentation but that was about the PLA Navy and so I'm going to go to the South China Sea now uh, that's a picture of a Chinese Coast Guard vessel using a water and cannon against a Vietnam, Vietnamese Coast Guard vessel. You may remember uh, last uh, spring, uh, China uh, moved their one uh, deep sea uh, oil rig, uh, drilling oil rig into disputed waters between uh, uh, China and Vietnam. You probably all know the geography, but just to, just to remind everybody, this is the Paracel Islands are right here, where that oil rig was, was right there. And it was within China or Vietnam's exclusive economic zone, which runs 200 miles from their coast. Which by the law of the sea, in theory, nobody can take economic resources out of there uh, except Vietnam. But China occupies the Paracel Islands. Vietnam claims that they they should have sovereignty, but China occupies them. 
They threw the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, out in 1974. Uh, so there, those islands also have an exclu exclusive economic zone. So those two zones overlapped, and the oil rig sat right in the overlap. And so it was disputed waters. And so both, both sides could argue, you're in my waters. Uh, well, that caused a, you know, there was a, a melee going on for over, um, you know, something like six weeks, where you had Vietnamese and uh, Chinese fishing boats and Coast Guard ships ramming each other, trying to head each other off, using water cannons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, uh, meanwhile, subsequently, of course, Vietnam and China have agreed that we're not going to, we're going to have discussions, and so they've tried, and party-to-party -party common uh, uh, dialogue have tried to, to, to put this genie back in the box as best they can, but uh, it's, it's kind of one of those things to stay tuned. Uh, but so the other disputes in the uh, South China Sea are down around the Spratleys and then up in the East China Sea, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, is the Senkaku Daiotai uh, uh, dispute. But why should we care about the South China Sea? Well, among other things, uh, this is a, from the uh, uh, Energy Information in, uh, Administration in Washington. Uh, those numbers in the circles indicate the, num the millions of barrels of oil that pass through there every day. So you can see there's a very large number coming out of the uh, Persian Gulf through the Straits of Hormuz, and then most of it goes uh, east uh, to the Straits of Malacca, where the second red circle is, and then up through the South China Sea, going to Northeast Asia, not only China, but to Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. Um, now, in all honesty, the South China Sea is not the only way to get oil to there by sea. As you can see, if, if you had to, you go all the way around Australia and steam up through the Central Pacific. And there are other straits that can take, besides Malacca, that, but if you did, let's say you take the Australia route, let's say for some reason the South China Sea was closed. It would be the equivalent of, you're all too young to remember this, but the 1967 uh, uh, Arab-Israeli War, the Suez Canal was shut. It was my, it was people scuttled ships in it and mined it. And so what happened, people, oil coming from the Persian Gulf had to sail all the way around Africa and up to Europe. What eventually happened is you just had more ships in the pipeline. And then things settled out. It just takes more ships. And it takes longer, so it's longer, it's more expensive, more time, more fuel burned, et cetera. But that's not, so it, when people talk about a choke point and how important the South China Sea is, it's important to keep in the back of your mind is the oceans of the world are seamless. That you don't have to go that way, it just happens to be the shortest and most economical way to go. A highlight or a mark I put across 12 degrees north latitude is essentially China has control of all of the land features north of 12 degrees north latitude. In other words, the northern half of the South China Sea. They have all the paracels. They've essentially kept the Filipinos away from the Philippines out of Scarborough Shoal. And so uh, it, while those areas to the north are disputed, i.e. disputed by Vietnam and the Philippines, nobody's going to try to use the military force to run the Chinese off. They're there. The area that is disputed is in the Spratly Islands, uh, south of the line, where you have, let me make sure I have the, get the numbers right here. China and Taiwan claim every bit of land in the South China Sea. Uh, Vietnam claims all of the Spratly Islands and all of the Paracel Islands. Uh, the Philippines claim about 53 of the Spratly Islands. There's about 140 of them. Uh, and they occupy seven or eight of them. Malaysia claims 12, and they occupy seven or eight of those. Uh, China occupies seven or eight of the Spratleys. Uh, and Taiwan only occupies one, but uh, it's the biggest one. And so it's kind of the old story about real estate, location, location, location. They, they, got, they, got, they, got, they got there first and occupied it, and they're still there. Um, but all of, these, all of these places that have been occupied in the Spratleys, they have sold, they have, uh, the, the Vietnamese uh, have uh, garrisons on them. Uh, the the uh, Taiwan 
Coast Guard, there's people in tai Taipei right now talking about we need to replace the Coast Guard with, with Marines. Uh, uh, the Philippines have forces on all their islands. And so everybody's squatting on these rocks and shoals in there. Um, uh, but probably is the status quo will pertain. I don't see anybody coming in to try to run somebody else off, particularly uh, the ones that are occupied by the Philippines. Because we have a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines, the United States does. Now that treaty does not cover Philippine claims because those claims were made after the treaty was signed and they're quite frankly legally very dubious. Uh, but the treaty does cover if somebody was to shoot up a Philippine Navy ship kill a Philippine soldiers or airmen, shoot down an airplane, and what have you. That means the potential of the mutual defense treaty with the U.S. would come into play and potentially, not likely, but potentially, the U.S. could find itself in a conflict with China over some Philippine-occupied rock or shoal in the Spratleys. That's why we care. Um, again, I, I want to emphasize this is highly unlikely. But that risk is, is there. Okay. The big issue, the big issue with um, the United States and the South China Sea, uh, in, in fact, it's in East China Sea, it has to do with surveillance, U.S. surveillance activities around, around the um, uh, Hainan Island. And you can take a look at that. But the big thing is we've agreed to disagree. And hopefully this year, both presidents have agreed to sign a standards of behavior agreement on air-to-air -air interactions so we don't have a, a replay of the mid-air collision that happened in 2001. I'm going to go through this because I'm getting a, we need to stop talking here, I think. So. Um, I'll let you just look at this. Here are what U.S. interests are. One of them is this issue of credibility. You know, are we a paper tiger or not? Is the rebalance a real thing? I've already mentioned the treaty with the Philippines. Here's what U.S. policy is. And I think the most important thing is the red box down here. The South China Sea is not the most important part of the U.S.-China relationship. Although a lot of people would like to make it that, it's not. We have lots of big issues. Iran, North Korea, trade, global warming, and what have you, that we have very important interests with China. And so people who try to make the South China Sea uh, is the most important factor, they're losing, they're losing perspective. You need to keep perspective uh, as to where the South China F Sea fits within the hierarchy of issues. The potential canal in Nicaragua. We know that the Panama Canal has been very significant, but it's only accounts for a very tiny proportion of global trade. Nonetheless, this is actually causing a, a lot of people to become very interested and, in fact, even concerned, given that it suggests potential Chinese greater involvement in the region. Uh, can you comment on that? Well, that's well, the reason, one reason why the Panama Canal is, it has such a small percentage is, is it's, it's too narrow. And that's why there were people, not we, the Panamanians are ex expanding the, uh, the canal so that in fact larger, some of these larger container ships can go through. Uh, you know, people have been talking about a Nicaragua Canal for years. I mean, if you, if you want to throw money down a black hole, I, I, it strikes me that's, that's a high probability e event. But uh, I, just don't, I just don't, uh, I don't see that it would make that much of it, that, that if it does come to pass, if in fact they're able to make uh, a, a canal through Nicaragua, uh, it will just contribute, there'll be still more international trade. I don't see any huge strategic issue involved in that. It, 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 it will facilitate trade. Um, will it make a difference? I just wonder if it would be economically uh, uh, relevant uh, given, uh, given the way trade uh, flows go right now. And um, so, that, but it's not my, it's not, it's not my uh, uh, area of expertise. We have people who know a hell of a lot more than I do. 
I'm Dinda Elliott with the mm -hmm. Paulson Institute. Um, and what is your sense? You've laid out kind of what there is in the South China Sea, what China has, et cetera, in terms of capability. But what's your sense of the real potential for conflict? I mean, it's, you know, Vietnam and China came close to it. There was a lot of nasty stuff going on, but you said they're now in kind of discussions, the discussion mode. You know, what's what? how do you see, you know, what might, might happen in the future in terms of real conflict? Well, I think, the, I think the possibility of conflict is very low because uh, the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese uh, were taught a lesson in 1978 when, when the PLA came and invaded them. And now people talk about how the PLA was roughly handled and, and they lost a lot of people and it was really a tactical victory. Well, it was a, for the Vietnamese, it was a strategic victory for the Chinese. They were poised. They stopped. Deng Xiaoping stopped them just as they were about to go into the Red River Valley and, and be able to surround Hanoi. And he, he stopped and said, we're not going any further. The Vietnamese have learned the lesson. As long as the PLA army, as the, the Chinese army can walk or drive to your border, you have a real serious security concern. Uh, and so uh, Vietnam is not going to precipitate a conflict. Now, on the other hand, in 1988, uh, a place called Johnson Reef, one of the uh, Spratleys, uh, both, both China and Vietnam were rushing to occupy it. Uh, the Vietnamese got there first, but the Chinese showed up and wound up shooting, uh, machine gunning about 70 uh, uh, Vietnamese sailors and Marines on one of these shoals as the tide was coming in and they were standing there. Uh, so the Vietnam has been building, putting in a capability to be able to defend their maritime approaches. So if China tried to use force to run the Vietnamese off one of the Spratly Islands they're currently on, I believe Vietnam would fight. But I don't think China is going to try to use force to run them off one of those Spratlys because I think they realize that Vietnam would fight. And Vietnam is building up their military. They're buying submarines. They're, the, they, Russian submarines, Russian airplanes, Russian anti-ship cruise missiles. So Vietnam's putting in place their own little area denial capability there to defend their maritime approaches. I'm Elliot Balch. I'm a student at the Harris School. Um, if the South China Sea is not the highest priority for U.S.-China relation, relations, um, where would you put the defense agreements that the U.S. has with Japan, the Philippines, um, and if they are, if if China has an interest in questioning those or loosening them, what, what would be the most probable? Well, our, our credibility, our credibility uh, as a reliable ally is, is absolutely essential uh, to the narrative of why the U.S. is in Asia. We are there to provide stability. We are there to, uh, in the stability that we provide, uh, in pa in, uh, creates a, uh, an environment for economic development, and it's in our interest. When President Obama was in Canberra in 2012, he made it perfectly clear that the rebalance was about creating American jobs by, if all of the money, if most of the money in the world is going to go to Asia, we want to build things in America and sell them to rich Asians. You know, that's, that's kind of the, that's the fundamental argument behind the rebalance. If the economic center of gravity of the world is shifting to Asia, we want to be part of that action. And so um, being involved there, uh, b being, being, uh, being seen as a reliable partner is very important in terms of U.S. policy. Uh, and I don't think China is very interested in trying to disrupt our alliances. Uh, Certainly the Japanese know right now that they depend upon the U.S. for their own security. We, by the same token, we depend upon the Japanese for our bases there. Without the Japanese, we couldn't maintain the military presence that we do in the region right now. And so um, uh, that's why the deterrent value of the alliance, I think, has kept, kept the uh, Chinese approach in the South China Sea is not the Navy. They're using the Coast Guard and their fishing boats. They're making sure that they have escalation control by not, ha not involving the military forces 
there. And so the, China's not interested in accidentally stumbling into a conflict with the United States by, by shooting up the Philippine, some Philippine ship or something, nor is it interested in stumbling into a conflict with the United States over the Senkakus. Now, by the same token, there are people in China who are skeptical of saying, would the U.S. really get into war with China over five uninhabited rocks in the East China Sea? You know, there are no expatriates and Kakians waiting to reoccupy their land, uh, their islands, or, and what have you. So, um, what would, would the U.S. really do that? Well, the president said when he was just in Japan just this past year that Article 5 of the alliance uh, covers the Senkaku. So, we have this situation of credibility, deterrent, are you willing to risk it? Are the stakes high enough, low enough, et cetera, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, Timothy Sharko from Battislade Investment Research. Just a question on the PLA Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been a defined role of the PLA Navy with respect to ensuring food security of Chinese agricultural investments in Africa and Latin America? Perhaps not in the degree of specificity you want, you would suggest, but China has has adopted one of the world's worst military acronyms known to man, MUTWA, M O O T W, military operations other than war. Uh, that would be peacetime, wouldn't it? But anyway, uh, 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 so. Uh, they, uh, the, the roles and missions of the PLA, not just the Navy, but the entire PLA, now incorporate this idea of MUTWA, military operations other than war, and one of the things that is specifically called uh, um, out in that is uh, protection of sea lanes. Now, they're talking about it in peacetime, which is what they're, that's, that's how they rationalize those anti-piracy patrols, but protection of sea lanes is also a wartime mission. Uh, but so the food security and what have you, whatever they're buying or growing in Africa or Latin America to get it back to China has to come by sea. So implicitly that's a, there's a PLA has an, inter, an interest in that. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Lei. I'm from, uh, I'm a student in statistics. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. They, uh, you just mentioned the war China against Vietnam in 1970s. I happen to have a question related to that one because some speculation that um, although China may not have a full-scale war um, against uh, the neighbors uh, in that area, maybe it wants somehow a swift and uh, quick uh, battle against one of the neighbors would, uh, which would help them gain some um, economic influ influence and even uh, domestic control. For example, Deng's war against V9 is like a strike and retreat like that. It does help China a lot in the subsequent, subsequent years, uh, politically, economically, and so on and so forth. So would that be a possibility um, in near future? And uh, I if so, uh, what do you think America's America's role in, in that kind of swift battle? Well, first of all, if China wants to, if China doesn't need to, to use military force to gain any more economic influence than they have. All of the countries that border China, all the countries that live in the shadow of China are China's, their largest trading partner is China. Their, eco their economies are increasingly intertwined. Uh, Xi Jinping's running around Southeast Asia talking about the Maritime Silk Road and the, uh, and the, uh, and the Overland Silk Road, uh, talking in, 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 in dollar terms of 20 billions here, 20 billion there, before you know it, we'll have real money. Uh, but seriously, uh, so you don't, they, don't need, they don't need to invade anybody, for goodness sake. To, yeah, but in some sense, let me just add this one. In some sense, uh, like Deng's battle, this, this may sound conspiracy theory, but in some sense, some people have believed that uh, the, the, the war against Bainan actually helped Deng consolidate his power well, domestically. Uh, yeah, Would that be because yeah, of I'm, I, yeah, yeah, I, whether, whether that was necessary for, for domestic purposes is, an, is, a, is another issue. Uh, but certainly, 
I think all of the countries that border China recognize uh, the growth of Chinese military power to the point where, except as I suggested, if, if Vietnam was attacked, they would fight back, that they're not, ab they're not about to give China a pretext for the use of military force. It would be very difficult uh, for, to do that. And, and obviously, what would the U.S. role play? I think, I think uh, it would be very difficult for any president to intervene in support of a country in Asia that was not already a U.S. treaty ally. It, it, again, it would be circumstances would, would dictate it, uh, but uh, is a general rule. Uh, the Vietnamese are not holding their breath expecting that we'll come to their rescue. Hi, my name's James. I'm a student in the college. Thank you for coming today. Mm -hmm. Building off your discussion of the perception of the U.S. as a reliable partner, do you think the recent push to revise the Japanese constitution to allow it to militarize is a reflection that the U.S. is maybe perceived as a less reliable partner under the Obama administration? Or it could be other factors like nationalism within the country? Well, you, you may have overstated the case a, a lot. Uh, whether Mr. Abe really, in his heart of hearts, wants to revise the Constitution, the, the political uh, reality in Japan is he's had a hard time just getting through uh, a collective self-defense, and it's going to be a very narrow collective self-defense piece, and, and uh, a total revision of the Constitution to remove the article uh, prohibiting uh, the use of force and what have you uh, is literally politically not on the table. Uh, break, break, but your other issue about uh, is Japan thinking about uh, developing an independent uh, defense, uh, more of an independent defense capability because they doubt U.S. credibility as a reliability, re reliable partner. Uh, at this stage, I would say no. In the future, perhaps. It would depend, uh, and uh, I think the first manifestation would be would be Japan would develop nuclear weapons is what they would do it is to guarantee their security. But uh, right now, that's not on the table. Uh, in other words, and there aren't very many people talking about that. Um, uh, obviously, one reason why the president and other U.S. officials go to Japan and reassure them constantly is, in fact, to make sure that we are perceived as a credible. We have a discussion going on right now with the Japanese over a revision of what they call roles and missions. How do you divide roles and missions historically? The Japanese role and mission was to act as a shield to defend themselves. In the US is the spear, i.e. we would attack whoever's attacking Japan. Uh, now, if China's, if people believe that China's anti-access area denial that I showed you will not work. I mean, will work and it keep the U.S. at bay. If Jap Japanese are convinced that's the case, then they could, so it's up to us, it's up to the United States to be able to make sure that while China introduces capabilities to keep, to try to keep the U.S. away if in case of war, that the U.S. introduces capabilities to assure that we can get there. So you have this competition going on today, and you know, I think it will continue to go on, where you have a competition on the Chinese side to deny access, and you have a competition on the U.S. side to assure access. And each side is introducing military capabilities uh, to hopefully, in our case, produce, reassure our allies that, that if the chips are down, we could show up. So. This is an unhealthy dynamic, by the way, <laughs> to say the least. But it, I mean, it's the reality. Good afternoon, sir. I'm uh, Paul Hoffman. I'm a reserve Marine and a uh, student at the Harris School. Um, I've spent some time on Okinawa and was a passenger on, some, uh, on the 31st Mew. My question is about the, you mentioned some of the blue water um, aspirations. What other kind of operational goals do you see China? Are they pursuing any bilateral military to military relationships, any prepositioning of material, um, you know, kind of more analogous to what uh, the U.S. uses our Navy and Marines for? Well, you put your finger on it. They're already doing it. What, we, what in the military you call engagement? They're, they're, those, those PLA Navy ships that are out, out in the, uh, halfway around the world, 
they make port visits all along the way. Uh, they sh you know, show the flag, uh, military diplomacy as some people call it. Uh, so there's a lot of that that they're doing and doing it very effectively. Um, and so, yes, the answer is yes, they're doing that. Um, uh, and there's nothing sinister or insidious about that. I mean, that's what, that's what navies do in peacetime. Um, but uh, that would be one of, military diplomacy is one of the missions that the, the PLA in writ large is expected to do. The Navy just happens to be able to do more of it because of their ability to move around in the oceans. My name is Liu Wei, a, a student at the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, so you mentioned that um, the ballistic mass missiles, they are not part of the Navy. Uh, like they officially don't belong to the Navy. But um, historically, it has been an advantage of the Chinese army. And now, you know, combine that with the modernization of the Navy, it will increasingly become a strength of the Navy. Um, so my question is, um, also, as we know that in 2010, the air-sea battle doctrine became an official strategy of the U.S. military. Um, okay, sort of, maybe. No, no, go ahead. Um, so I'm wondering, like, can you elaborate that um, in the Navy context? You know, how, um, you know, what are some of the implications, especially how is that um, doctrine, um, how does that um, counterbalance the most recent development in the Chinese Navy? It's a very good question. Uh, I wouldn't call it a doctrine or even a strategy. I think it's a concept of operations is how, if you want to be technically precise. But essentially, uh, for those who may not know, it's essentially what I saw when I talked about the U.S. assuring access. This is, this is a concept of how the U.S. would assure access. How do you, how do you deal with the, not only the submarines, but how do you deal with the ballistic missiles and what have you? And, so the, the range of options could go to sending the Air Force bombers to downtown Beijing or to, to blow up uh, shore base facilities in China uh, to the other end would be having missiles on your ship to shoot down the incoming missile, just defending yourself. And so you have to ask yourself, uh, would, first of all, is anybody, would any president approve the, uh, the procurement of, research, of, of uh, capabilities specifically to, to attack another nuclear armed power? Uh, or would he uh, not, or if you had those capabilities, would he approve the do of it? Would he risk the escalation of nuclear war? Uh, by allowing the Air Force to go attack shore facilities and, or facilities ashore in China. On the other hand of the our part of the RC, air sea battle, you can jam things. As I say, you can shoot them down. Uh, you can use decoys uh, so that the, when the missile seeker turns on, it's looking at a decoy as opposed to a ship. Uh, so there are, there, as I say, there's a range of things that are captured under this umbrella. And the ones that gotten the most attention, of course, are the ones that are the scariest, which are, i.e., let's go attack facilities in China. So most, much of it is highly classified, seriously. I mean, I'm not making that up, I mean, seriously. Uh, because cl clearly if there's uh, things that you want to do, be able to do, you certainly don't want to advertise what that would be so that the other side could build a countermeasure. So um, uh, that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> but I guess we're at the finishing time, so thank you.